The Fletcher Seventh-day Adventist Church is a Christian people who believe Jesus is the Son of God, the hope of the world, who died on the cross to redeem us all for eternal life with God. Our purpose is to lift Jesus up and love people in. Visit our website at www.fletchersda.org. And now be blessed by the Holy Spirit as you listen to a Bible message. The scripture reading today will be found in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. And it says, Though I speak with the, with the tongues of men and of angels, but have no love, I have become sounding brass or a, or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can move mountains, but have no love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have no love, it profits me nothing. Last night, we started talking about relationships, specifically our relationship to the world, how to face hate without becoming hateful. And today, this morning, we're going to talk from the Creation Health material, interpersonal relationships, a little more deeper into relationships themselves. And then this afternoon, we're going to finish with really two things we're going to do. One, we're going to talk about our relationship with God because I found that in my travels, at least, many Christians, especially in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, in my opinion, this is my, sp- my perspective, they, um, they don't fully appreciate what that relationship means because of some things that have skewed their perception and life experiences. So we're going to touch on that, and we're also going to touch on our relationship with ourselves through the vehicle of outlook because without those two things, you really can't be effective with what we're going to talk about here right now and also last night. You have to have the relationship with God thing right and what that means, what it really means from the grace orientation and also why maybe you could be frustrated, why we're frustrated in certain of our relationships, even though we're doing everything else, quote unquote, right. So this afternoon is very important, you know, for those who want to finally experience some relief, a greater sense of fulfillment or joy in their relationships, not only with God, but with themselves so they can finally get um, the quality of relationship that they want. So this morning, you know, it's all about relationships anyway. We notice the veterans and they stood and we appreciate their service to the country. And I know they were fighting and protecting our freedom, but at the end of the day, it really is about relationships. Relationships there and relationships here in the church. Nothing else matters. It's relationships. And it seems to me that sometimes when it comes to Christians and churches, they have this feeling that, well, we have the truth, so we don't need people. But it's about relationships. So this morning we're talking about interpersonal relationships from the Creation Health material. Um, it's, uh, Creation Health is an acronym. Many of you know this because you have the hospital nearby, and this is an Adventist health system thing. Creation Health stands for choice, rest, environment, activity, trust in God, interpersonal relationships, outlook, and nutrition. Today we're going to focus on relationships. And the key text for Creation Health is John 10.10, 10, that Jesus came that we might have abundant life. And there is no abundant life without meaningful, fulfilling relationships. Dr. Dean Ornish wrote about social connection. I'm not aware of any other factor in medicine, not diet, smoking, exercise, stress, not genetics, drugs, surgery, that has a greater impact on our quality of life, incidence of illness, and the premature death from all causes. How many here have heard of Dr. Dean Ornish? What is he known for? Reversing heart disease. So you have, the, you have this physician who just made that statement, and you would think he'd say, maybe you should limit, reduce your saturated fats, you know, exercise 150 minutes a week, that these things would have a greater impact on your health. But he says, no, of all the things that he has seen in his career, it's social connection that has the greatest impact on our health and longevity. One third of people report feeling lonely. Look at the third bullet point. Loneliness is becoming a major disease. Up to the first one, 25% of Americans have no one to confide in. That means one in four people that we meet, they are socially bankrupt. They have nobody. I don't know if we could say this. You might be able to say that one of four people, guests that come into your place of business, one in four guests that come through these church doors, maybe they're socially bankrupt too just to acknowledge them and let them know that you know they're there and that you care, just to show some interest can actually be a life-saving thing to these people. In fact, the third bullet point, 
loneliness increases premature death, risk of premature death by up to 500%. Uh, This is especially a sharp pain when it's happening within the church because it's the last place you'd expect you'd feel lonely, but sometimes it's the place where people feel loneliest. And it's especially profound and bitter and life-altering when loneliness and isolation happens within a marriage. And there are people in this room who knows what that's like. So loneliness. Is loneliness a type of pain, yes or no? Say yes, yes. So what do people do with their pain? They numb it. The first thing they do is they try to get rid of it, right? Oftentimes, we aren't successful in getting rid of our pain. We know we hurt. We don't know why. We know know what it is. We're lonely, but we don't know why. We'll get into a little bit of that this afternoon. So if they can't get rid of it, they do what the gentleman said back there. They numb it. And so do you think when we numb our pain, we actually numb it most of the time with things that are helpful and positive? for us? No. See, people are so miserable and lonely, especially loneliness. It's so deep and severe and so isolating. And people, if they feel they can't get away from it, all they want is they want a few minutes of peace in the day where they're not feeling that pain. And they'll do things to them like, well, let's look at the next slide. I think it's there. They will abuse drugs, alcohols. You could put overreading down there. Um, Smoke, overwork. You know, let's talk about overwork. In the faith community, it's as if overworking, workaholism, is elevated as a value to be praised and to be embraced. You know, it really isn't. Sometimes there's more work to do than the day you have to do it in. That happens to all of us. I've had two months like that myself. But there are times, you know, we use workaholism just to mask our pain. As long as you're throwing yourself into your work, guess what you don't have to deal with? The problems you're having at home or the problems you're having with your kids, or whatever. It's a way of distracting you. When we feel loved, however, we tend to choose healthier behaviors. You know, I uh, had the privilege recently, I was invited to do creation health training in the Middle Eastern North Africa Union. And so I was over there in April, I think it was. It was really cool. I was kind of nervous to go to Egypt. Um, They actually held the, the meeting in Sharm El Sheikh, And I was a little nervous because that's where the Russian airliner was bombed two years ago, flying out. And they still haven't found who did it. They thought it was an airport airport employee. So these things go through your mind when you're flying in. And you're sitting sitting on the plane, and you see the map of the plane kind of flying across the territory. And you know you're no longer at home. When on that map, you see Benghazi, Cairo, these places like this. So I didn't know really what to expect, but I went there and uh, security all over the place, which made me feel so good. I really did. I'd never have appreciated security in my life as much as I did there. Everywhere, security. There was security actually getting into my hotel. (laughs) You couldn't get into the hotel lobby without going through scanners and x-ray machines. And in the meeting hall where we had, every single session we had, you had to walk through security to get into the place where we were having our meetings. And uh, those folks, there are 30 health ministries directors from all of that region, I mean from you know, uh, Dubai to Alexandria to Beirut, all over. And these people, they're fearless. The conditions they're serving in, serving the needs of their friends, I mean, it's not an easy, it's not an easy job and it's not easy ministry, but they were smiling, they were joyful, they were happy. And one of our ministry, health ministries directors, he serves in, in Beirut, and um, they're reaching out to their community just to help people out a little bit. And a lady came and they did uh, some biometrics, and they found that her fasting glucose was over 500. And that's pretty serious stuff, obviously. And so they started working with her and got her the help that she needed, but they found out her story. She was one of two wives, and her husband was madly in love with the other one. And they knew that she was diabetic, And what she told our team was that he influenced her, encouraged her not to take care of herself so she would die sooner. And so she had descended into this state of uh, depression, pervasive hopelessness. It's just a, a miracle, an act of grace that our team and she connected. And they found her, and so they befriended her and brought her into you know, the family, and she had hope 
hopeful, she had hope again. And they gave her the medicine that she needed and everything's under control and she's now part of a community of people and her life is turned around. But the fact is, if you don't feel like your life matters, if you don't feel like anyone cares about you, you won't take care of yourself because you don't see the point. You don't even have a desire to take care of yourself if you feel like people don't care about you. I know you can't see this. It's too small. This is a screenshot from the CDC. Felt it would be interesting to figure out what the 10 leading causes of death are per age group. And so the only important thing you really need to kind of look at is you can see the colors. And you see the green squares up there? The green squares are suicide. Now, it's tragic to me to notice that starting with the age, ages of 10 to 14, all the way on over to the ages of 54, suicide is in the top five leading causes of death. In fact, it's the third leading cause of death for 10 to 14-year-olds. It's the second cause of death for 15 to 34-year-olds. And then it starts dropping down a little bit, and it doesn't seem to go away until actually you get to 65, then it's not on the list anymore. So what you have here is a lot of this is driven by misery within relationships. We see more and more of this happening. And this is why it's important we're talking about this this weekend. And I think it's also so beautiful that you're sending something to Texas, a card. And I know this community, your church reaches out to people here. But people, they feel abandoned, isolated. They feel like there's no pathway out of their chronic misery. And so what happens these days we see more and more frequently is people say, you know what, I can't take this anymore. I don't see a solution, so I'm just going to end the pain permanently, and they take their lives. It's about relationships, and there's a place and role for this church when it comes to people and relationships. A more profound role, I, I think, than we probably even recognize. The Alameda County... California study took place over 40 years, followed 7,000 people. And they were looking at what would be the, the strongest predictor of why people were healthy and lived long. So you can read the slide as well as I can, but I want to read, um, I, I want to read a paragraph from the researchers. This is not on the screen. You can take the slide off if you'd like. Researchers say, now I'm going to read you one short sentence. I'm going to read you one long sentence. This is from the researchers who did this for 40 years. They said social connection helps prevent premature death. Listen to this. I'm going to read slowly. It is a more powerful predictor of health and longevity than age, gender, race, social economic status, self-reported physical health status, and health practices such as smoking, alcoholic beverage consumption, overeating, physical activity, and utilization of preventative health services as well as a cumulative index of health practices. So what these folks are saying is, out of everything you could conceivably do to stay healthy and live longer, the one thing that impacts your health the most is making friends. Sure, we should eat right. Sure, there should be some exercise thrown in there. And yes, there's a spiritual component. They are saying the thing, the single independent predictor of whether you'll be healthy and live long is how many fulfilling relationships that you have. The church needs to be a place where people can come in and feel loved and belonging and forgiveness and hope. It needs to be a haven. It needs to be a place where they're freed from this misery of loneliness and isolation. When we feel loved, we choose healthy behaviors. And they also did a study on 100-year-olds. The Seventh-day Adventist Church produces more centenarians than any organization on the planet. And this is what they found the 100-year-olds have in common. What's number two on the list? Social connection. You have to look long and hard to find a 100-year-old who's isolated. In fact, they don't exist. When we talk about social connection, we're talking about different things. One of those things is social support. One of those things is touch. But I have to share this research with you. They took breast cancer survivors and they wanted to see what the effect of social connection is. And those who had the social connection, you can see on the slide there, they lived longer and, um, and everything else. But I want to read this piece of uh, research from two doctors that were kind of fighting. Well, one doctor was fighting with the other one. You've had, everyone here has heard of Dr. Siegel, correct? The guy who's written about psychosocial connections and its impact on health. He's well-known, famous author. And so you had this other doctor named Dr. Spiegel who couldn't stand Dr. Siegel because everybody was confusing Siegel with him. 
So Dr. Spiegel had this agenda. He was going to do a research project to disprove all of Siegel's work. So he hand-selected this group of women who had breast cancer, and he's going to prove that social connection had nothing to do with their recovery and with their longevity. And so he's actually being interviewed by, um, uh, by the doctor we talk, talked about earlier. Ornish, thank you very much. And so this is what he says, Ornish. This is a direct quote from Spiegel to Ornish. He says, I finally got around to looking at the data, and I almost fell off of my chair. Those women who had the weekly support group live an average of twice as long as did the other group of women who didn't have the support group. All of the women, all of them in the comparison group who did not have the support group were dead after five years. The only women still alive were those who had received the weekly group support sessions. Also, the time from the first metastasis to death was significantly longer than those who had received the weekly support groups. So he became a believer in Siegel's stuff and uh, made his peace with that from then on. The weekly support group. There is a built-in group in this church, in every church. It's called Bible study. It's called Sabbath school, whatever you want to call it. And I would say that as important as the study is for that day, the topic and content, the most important thing that could take place in that vehicle would be the interaction, the social connection, actually looking out and taking care and taking an interest in the people's lives who actually come to that. I mean, where else is that going to happen in the church? Maybe prayer meeting? But face it, you work hard, you have kids, you have these responsibilities. Sometimes you find other ways to spiritually nurture yourself instead of coming to prayer meeting in these other places. But this morning, Sabbath morning, we have worship, we have study, and that's where some of these things can take place. If we were just a little creative and put a little effort in trying to do things maybe just a little differently to meet the need we've been put here to meet in the first place. My two cents. Trick question. What predicts positive aging? Low cholesterol at age 50 or a good marriage? It's a good marriage. If your cholesterol is under 200, but you have a stressful marriage, you have, pro you have problems. This tells us that the way God created this system, there are compensating factors here that maybe if you're not eating the way you should be, you think, or exercising as much as you should, and we all should, there are compensating mechanisms at work in our body so that we're healthier than sometimes we, we really ought to be, I guess, the research suggests at least. Touch is a part of this social connection. We live in a real weird society these days where it's getting weirder and weirder and weirder where you can't touch, you feel uncomfortable touching, and there's appropriate touch and there's inappropriate touch and all that stuff. But there is no doubt about it. Research shows that touch boosts health, immune system, and feelings of um, connectedness. In fact, they took infants who were born prematurely, and what they did was all the nurses did with these kids in the NICU was they would stroke their arms and their legs three times a day for 15 minutes each time. That's it, they got the same interventions, medicines, everything else they needed, but they got touched three times a day for 15 minutes, and they found that these kids were hospitalized six days left, less and saved their families $3,000 on average. And all they did was touch these kids. Human touch can save a life. In fact, I could tell you this story. There were two little girls, Kiri and Brielle, who were born 12 weeks too soon. Now, Kiri was doing well, but Brielle wasn't. In fact, Brielle's blood oxygen levels were not good at all, and she was wasting. She wasn't gaining weight. She was actually going in the other direction. And the nurse and the NICU knew that things did not look good for Brielle. So she went to the person in charge, and she said, you know, I just attended this seminar on the role of touch and how it can turn lives around, and I would, I'm wondering, is it possible for us to put these two little girls in the same incubator? Which, at the time this happened, it was against national policy in hospitals to put two infants in the same incubator. But the administrator said, talk with the parents. If it's okay with them, it's okay with us. And he said, just have them sign a form that we won't be you know, responsible should something happen there. And so parents are going to do it. They're going to do anything they can to save their children, right? So they put both these girls in the same incubator. And immediately, without being prompted, you have Kiri, who put her arm around her little sister, Brielle. And some theorize, well, maybe it's because they were so close in the womb that 
they were missing that connection, and, and they wanted that, and Brielle, you know, Kiri wanted to touch her sister, Brielle. That same day, as the little sister, Kiri, reached over and touched Brielle and hugged her, Brielle's blood oxygen levels started rising, and every day after that, she gained weight until she caught up with her little sister, and they're both discharged two healthy babies from the hospital. And the only difference was, was touch. Sometimes, if all you do when someone walks into here is shake their hand, put your hand on their arm, or put your arm around their shoulder, you are literally pointing a life in a life-saving direction. Just don't make it creepy. <laughs> Enough creepiness stuff happening, it seems like. Every time I look at the headlines, I almost don't even want to look at the headlines anymore. It's interesting that animals, they provide this too, this touch. In fact, look at the screen. Second bullet point. So they, they looked at the people who had survived heart attack, and usually when you have a heart attack, your risk for a subsequent heart attack is much higher. A year later, they went back and studied these people in this group, and only 6% of the pet owners died compared to 28% of the, of the patients who did not own pets. And that third, it says the finding was independent of disease severity, I mean, this is shocking, exercise or other known factors. It was having a pet that allowed them to touch and have that medicinal effect take place in their body. You know, they did another study with pets, with men who had high blood pressure problems, hypertension, and they wanted to see if a best friend or a dog, which one would have the better effect on the person's health? Which one do you think it was? It was the dog. <laughs> help lower the man's blood pressure and help get to a healthier state because Although his friend was a best friend, the friend was perceived as someone who had an opinion on the issue, where the dog was just giving what? Unconditional love. Come on, with the grace of Christ, we should be able to love at least as well as a dog, can't we? I think so. Tips for healthy relationships. Scan them, but go down to number eight. Don't play fair. If you want to have miserable, unhealthy, unfulfilling relationships, just play fair. I mean, that's how we're taught. And playing fair is, whatever you do to me, I'm going to do to you. You give me the cold shoulder, I'm giving you the cold shoulder. You talk badly about me, I'm talking badly about you. We play fair. That's how we've been taught, that's how we've been raised. And you know what? It's wrong. Not only is it wrong, it's not even Christian. And it happens in this church, Every church, I can say that now, I've been doing this for enough years, growing up in the church too as a pastor's kid, people play fair. And there's this silly thing that people say and they think they're being so good and they think they're being so noble when it comes to relationships. Well, we think relationships are a 50-50 thing. No, they're not. Well, the unhappy ones are, yes. If you want to have an unhappy relationship, then just stick with that 50-50 thing. But they're not 50-50. In fact, there are four levels of relationships. It's not on the screen. Uh, you might, might want to write it down. Level one is what we call selfish. This is like an infant. I mean, how can they be anything other than selfish, right? You've had kids, you know what this is like. Level two is what we call trade. 50-50. You give 50%, I'll give 50%. Level three is where we move into now this idea of, you know what, I don't believe relationships are 50-50. I believe that relationships are 100%. And I'm going to come into this relationship with 100% of myself, regardless of how much you give. So if I think my relationship needs to be warmer, guess how I can make it warmer? I can become warmer. If I think it needs more forgiveness, how can I add it? I can be more forgiving. If I feel my relationship needs to be more affectionate, guess what? how I can change it? I can be more affectionate. I can't control you. I can influence you, but I can control me. And I want a healthy relationship, so I'm not going to do this 50-50 dance with you. I'm coming with everything that I have into this relationship and taking 100% responsibility. If you had a partner like that, do you think that type of influence in the relationship might trigger a more positive response from you? Something's going to happen. But there's a fourth level. So you have selfish, you have trade, you have 100%. The fourth level we would say sacrificial. This is a person who says, I'm going to take 100% responsibility for this relationship and the values I want it to have and the 
culture I wanted to have. And I'm going to behave in this way and act in this way even when you're hurting me. Now, I'm not talking about domestic violence. If you're in a domestic violence situation, you need to go get to a place of safety, whether you're female or male, because it happens in both areas these days. So I'm not talking about that. But if you are in a relationship and you feel like you're being hurt, you're still going to be 100% present and being what you want that relationship to be, even though it's hurting you. And this is a decision. We talked about it last night, agape. It's a decision. You act this way even when you don't feel like it. We can talk more about that, but I need to wrap things up. I will review that this afternoon just a little bit because it ties into two other things we're talking about today at 2 o'clock. John D. Rock Rockefeller Jr. said, giving is the secret of a healthy life. Not necessarily money, but what every person has of encouragement, sympathy, and understanding. It's amazing that he wrote this because his dad was a miserable human being. His father, Rockefeller Sr., was uh, like a millionaire by the time he was 33 or 34. He was in the oil industry, and he was the world's first billionaire when he was in his early 50s. But the thing was, his employees hated him. They hated him so much because they felt he was exploiting them to amass this great wealth that what they would do is they would hang him in effigy in the oil fields and light, light him on fire. They hated him so much that they threatened to kill him, and it was so serious that he had to have bodyguards 24 hours a day, Rockefeller Sr. And it was affecting his health so profoundly, he was so sick that the only thing he could keep down were milk and crackers. His hair was falling out, he had alopecia, and his doctors, when he was 53 years old, came and said, Mr. Rockefeller, your health is deteriorating so rapidly that we think you might have about 12 months left to live. So if you have any affairs you need to put in order, this is the time to do it because we think you don't have much time. Coming face to face with death got leverage on him emotionally and he started making some changes and he realized that he was a mean man, that he'd been living for himself exclusively, had been using and exploiting and hurting others just to amass wealth and do what he wanted to do. Interesting thing is, I don't know if he was practicing or not, I was looking into it. Do you know he was a Christian? From the Northern Baptist Church. I don't know if he was practicing or not, probably not, wasn't in here at least. So what he decided was he was going to start living for somebody other than himself. And at the age of 53, he started investing his great wealth to make this world a better place. And I didn't realize some of these things until I was looking at the story. You obviously know we have the Rockefeller Foundation. Even now, they've invested billions. So he started investing his millions and millions of dollars back then in hospitals, universities, and missions. Um, listen to this. I didn't know this. His generosity, Rockefeller Sr., his generosity aided and the discovery of penicillin. Didn't know. His contributions to medicine enabled researchers to find cures for tuberculosis, malaria, diphtheria, and other diseases. And his contributions helped rid the South of its greatest physical and economic plague, at least back then, the hookworm. So at 53, he stopped living for himself and started living for other people and for this planet. So do you think that might have had an effect on his health? Just a little bit. In fact, let me ask you, do you have any idea, and if you do, play along, let people have a guess, any idea when he might have died? Doctor said at 53, he'd be dead at 54, likely. A lot of people usually say 70s, some in the early 80s. Rockefeller Sr. actually died just a couple of months shy of his 98th birthday. That was a different man the second half of his life. It's because he started giving back. And that's why his son, can we bring up that slide we just read, the quote? His son said, giving is the secret of a healthy life, not necessarily money, but whatever a person has of encouragement, sympathy, and understanding. He learned that from his dad, who by the grace of God turned his life around and lived another, let's see, 98 minus 50, another 45 years, basically, <laughs> after having been told he had 12 months to live. So what are we going to do? What are some relationships? What, I want you to think, as we close this up today, what is a relationship that you'd like to improve? The best place to start, the most difficult place to start, is with your marriage. So maybe that's something you can start praying about if you're in that situation. But what is one relationship this week, because this doesn't have to be marriage. We have people in here who have good friends and all these other things. 
what's one relationship you'd like to work on this week? And which one of these four things could you do to start trying to make that relationship a little bit better? Could you send a card like the church is sending to our sister church in Texas? Could you call them? Could you set a lunch or dinner date or something? Could you just go hug them? Just go hug them and acknowledge them. I want you to think of one person, at least one person, that you're going to do something positive for this week to make a difference in their life. And as you make a difference in their life, by the way, you're going to make a difference in their life. And what I want you to take away from this, all of us take away from relationships this morning is this, because I said relationships is not 50-50, it's not trade. Here's what we have to get right. We must have this orientation if, we're going to, if we are going to be effective with relationships, if we're going to have meaningful, happy relationships. If God is going to be able to use this church to make Jesus real to this community in the world, we have to get this right, and this is what, this is what it is. Relationships are a place we go to give, not get. We go to relationships to give, not get. We go to relationships to give, not get. And as we make that shift, let me tell you, a whole new world opens up for us. A happier world and better world, fulfilling world. And in that, and in that instance, people actually get to see that Jesus Christ and his grace are real. And that's really exciting. I want to leave you with this thought. Remember, it's better to eat Twinkies with your friends than broccoli by yourself. <laughs> the research proves it. But then I always had the potluck police cost me after church saying, you know, it's better to eat broccoli with your friends than Twinkies at all. So whatever. That's why I'm the health ministry's director and my word is law when it comes to this. <laughs> As you make that choice to improve your relationships, you're just one choice away from living a better life and having life to the fullest. I'd like to pray for you today and us because what we've been talking about here, as we talked about last night, this right here, going to relationships to give versus get, I can't do that. It's a grace thing. It's a God thing. And we need him because that's what he did for us. Level four on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Everything he did was modeling and demonstrating and expressing that he came to us to give, not get. And I want to be just like him, don't you? All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for being the best dad we could ever ask for. And we thank you for the gift of life and love that you gave to us and continue give, giving to us. Father, you know every story in this room, you know every story of every person who's watching via the stream. And I pray through the power of your Holy Spirit, you place on all of our hearts the face of one person that we can give some love to this week to make their life a little bit sweeter, a little bit brighter, and make our lives a little bit more happier too along the way. Please place that face in our hearts right now. Please place your grace in our hearts that we'll have the strength and the will to follow through and bring you to them so they can taste and see that you are good. Thank you, Father, for being with us. Help us to remember that although we leave this place, we never leave your presence. In your name we pray. Amen. We trust your relationship with God has been strengthened from what you have heard today. Please visit our website at www.fletchersda.org. May God give you his peace and joy.